This morning, I'm, well, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Katrina Sifford, who holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of London King's College and is the Associate Professor and Chair of the Philosophy Department at Elmhurst College. After leaving King's, Katrina held a postdoctoral position as a Rockefeller Fellow in Law and Public Policy and Visiting Professor at Dartmouth College. Before becoming a philosopher, Katrina earned a law degree and worked as a senior research analyst on criminal justice projects for the National Institute of Justice. Katrina is the author of numerous articles and book chapters, including co-authoring the fabulously titled On the Criminal Culpability of Successful and Unsuccessful Psychopaths. <laughs> she describes herself as a philosopher interested in criminal responsibility and punishment, whose research focuses on scientific explanations of decision-making and action, and the way they intersect with criminal culpability. Please welcome Dr. Sifford. I'm, I'm hooked in here, so I think I'm OK. Thank you, though. I, I, I like to roam around usually when I give talks, but um, I, I may have to wander too far to see my own slides, so I'll probably stay up here if, that, if that's all right with you. Um, I really appreciate being invited to speak with you today on the subject of my current research, which is the intersect of consciousness and criminal culpability. I've worked on criminal responsibility for a dozen years now, first as an attorney and now as a philosopher. So um, I've explored different areas of criminal responsibility and now I've really been focusing on the nature of consciousness and the way in which consciousness may or may not be required for criminal responsibility. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a brief roadmap of the talk. I'm echoing a little, I think. Yes. <clears throat> I think I'm echoing a little. <clears throat> so traditionally, according to the kind of the old school models of criminal responsibility, consciousness was thought to be um, required for criminal responsibility. As scientific research into consciousness moves forward, we realize that there's many different senses in which something can be conscious. And as a philosopher of criminal responsibility, I started to wonder in what sense consciousness might be required for cr criminal responsibility, if at all. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> some of you may be familiar with the structure of the criminal law, but I'm going to run through some of the kind of the basics of the requirements for a criminal verdict very quickly before I get into discussions of consciousness. Under the criminal law, there's two requirements for criminal guilt. There has to be a particular act that causes criminal harm. So this is the, in Latin, the actus reus requirement. The act that causes or constitutes criminal harm must have been done voluntarily, not due to a seizure um, or, and this is a question we'll talk about a little bit later, one, one is asleep. One has to intentionally commit an act and that causes the criminal harm according to this requirement. The second requirement is the mens rea or mental state requirement. When that act was committed, one has to have had a particular mental state with regard to that act. So traditionally under the model penal code, which is the standard for state penal codes, um, I had to have committed a crime purposely or knowingly, knowing that there was going to be criminal harm that was caused by that act. And then there are lower standards of recklessness and negligence. So <clears throat> this is just an overview of the Illinois crime of homicide. The actus reus that's required for homicide in Illinois is the killing of another human being. Um, the mens rea requirement is purposely or knowingly killing another or killing another recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. These are the things that the prosecution is trying to prove when someone is standing trial for homicide in Illinois. <clears throat> As a philosopher, when I first started doing my PhD, I wondered, you know, why we really care what's going on in a defendant's head. If a defendant committed an act that caused the death of another human being, Aren't they responsible for that regardless of what was going on in their head? Um, well, no. We really want to be able to tell these two guys apart. This person who you know, was carrying a weapon in a place where a weapon is, is OK, let's say a shooting range, 
was walking carefully, carrying their weapon, tripped over a stone, fell on the weapon, and the weapon fired and killed somebody. We probably wouldn't hold that person responsible. Not for homicide, at any rate. This person was carrying a weapon in a shopping market and shot someone. That person we want to hold responsible. In we really care about differentiating between these two defendants by n trying to figure out what's going on in their minds, right? One of them did not have the intent to kill. One of them did. Um, again, the harm done is exactly the same. But really, the reason why we distinguish between the two of them has to do with what we want punishment to do, what punishment is for criminal punishment. Um, if for our accidental killer, who doesn't have a purposeful mental state, right, that person would not have been deterred by the threat of punishment. They couldn't have not fallen on their gun with the threat of punishment hanging over them. Right? Um, they're not likely to be dangerous in the future. We might not want them carrying loaded weapons anymore. But they're not likely to be someone who shoots someone else in the future. They don't deserve incapacitation. And they're not considered a morally bad agent, so they don't deserve retribution. Um, these are the standard purpose, purposes of punishment, and they don't really apply to our accidental killer. But our purposeful murderer could have been deterred with the threat of punishment. That person who walked into the crowded shop, shopping market with a gun knew that they might be punished for that act. It could have been something that they took into consideration before pulling the trigger. They are likely to be dangerous in the future. Someone who has killed once is maybe someone who would kill again, um, and they're considered a morally bad person who deserves to have something bad happen to them under the principle of retribution. So mental states matter. They really matter with regard to degree of criminal culpability. And what a jury is usually doing when they're sitting in a trial is trying to figure out the extent of the mental state of the defendant. Right? It's very rare that, a, that a, and I spent a couple years at 26th in California, which is the Cook County Criminal Courthouse. I observed many murder trials, and almost never is the prosecution trying to establish that this is the person who killed. Right? If there was a question about that, the case would have pled out. If this is the person that killed, we're usually clear on that, the jury is sitting there listening to evidence of motive and opportunity and trying to figure out the extent to which the person wanted to kill this particular person under these circumstances. So they're trying to figure out the degree of mental state that this particular offender had, and then punishment kind of depends on that degree of mental state, if it was reckless versus purposeful, a deliberative killing. <clears throat> All right, so the focus of the talk today, though, is whether these culpable mental states that the jury is looking for have to be conscious, and in what sense, if yes, they have to be conscious. So there are two basic questions, right? Um, in what sense the intent has to be conscious? And then, is it really the consciousness of that mental state that matters? Or is it maybe something else, something else in the person's cognitive architecture that matters? OK, so now I'm going to start talking about some of the different senses in which something can be conscious. And there is more than the four I'm going to discuss today. But I focused on four of the kind of most discussed in the literature, both within cognitive science and within philosophy and law, the most common sorts of consciousness that people talk about. The first is creature consciousness. So the first sort of question we can ask is whether this entity that we're ascribing consciousness to is the sort of entity that could have consciousness. Um, and usually the test for this is, is there something it's like to be that thing? Is that, does that thing have a perspective on the world? It's a pretty low bar, right? So bats of the first type have this sort of consciousness. Nagel famously asked in a philosophy article, what is it like to be a bat? There is something it's like to be a bat, right? It's something very different than human beings given their sensory organs. But there is something it's like to be the first kind of bat. There is not something it's like to be the second kind of bat. Right? That bat we do not, is not the sort of entity that we would want to ascribe consciousness to. <laughs> Same with rocks, cars, and thermostats, although there is a philosopher who wants to ascribe consciousness to thermostats. <laughs> All right, so we can look at the entire entity and then see if it's the sort of entity that could have consciousness. And then within that entity, there's sorts of consciousness, state consciousness. Right? Human beings are the sorts of things that have consciousness, but we have certain states within us 
that are conscious and certain states within us that aren't. Certain aspects of my cognitive architect architecture are conscious, but states of my liver are not, right? So we have to now try and figure out what states are conscious. And there's three different senses in which philosophers and cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have argued that states can be conscious. The first is phenomenal consciousness. And this is just, the state has a phenomenal feel. It has a feel to it. So when I smell a rose, I have a sensation of smelling the rose. That's a state within me that has a feel. This is also the sort of consciousness that the bar is pretty low. Bats have this sort of consciousness. Infants, very young infants, have this sort of consciousness. Then there's these two other sorts of arguments about the sort of state that can be consciousness that set the bar higher than just phenomenal feel. One is higher order thought consciousness. There is a fairly famous theory that says that if I'm having a thought about another one of my thoughts, that makes the thought conscious. A thought about a thought. And then there's another sort of theory that's gaining popularity now that's called access consciousness. If I have a thought that has access to a wide part of my cognitive architecture, that's a th conscious thought. So it has access to my memories, my phenomenal feels, my sensory sensations, all sorts of representations. Then that's a thought that's conscious. And I'm going to talk about these two other, these two latter theories in some detail today. All right, so what sort of consciousness, just from that quick overview, might matter to criminal responsibility? It can't be creature consciousness, right? Because we don't hold bats of the first type responsible when they eat a mouse or do anything, right? They're not the sorts of entities that can be conscious or can be responsible, but they are conscious. So that can't be the sort of consciousness that matters. And it can't be phenomenal feel either that gets you responsibility because infants have this, and again, bats of the first type, right? So it can't be that, that if you have a phenomenal feel and then you kill someone, you're responsible. It has to be a higher standard than that if consciousness is gonna matter to criminal responsibility. So now we can turn to these latter two types of consciousness. <clears throat> Everyone recognizes this guy, right? Bernie Madoff. <laughs> um, and Let's think about Bernie Madoff in terms of this hot theory, a thought about a thought, right? Bernie Madoff um, has a thought about a thought here in my bubble. <laughs> He's thinking about his desire to steal money from people, right? His thinking about that desire makes it conscious, according to this theory. And because he's made that desire to steal conscious, he can now start deliberating with regard to that thought. Right? If he just had that base desire to steal, he might steal unconsciously. Right? Not really be able to weigh the pros and cons of that desire and make a plan with regard to that desire. But he had, and let's be clear, he had a conscious thought about this desire to steal people and affected a very sophisticated plan for he made off. So maybe this is the sort of consciousness that matters to responsibility and Bernie Madoff is responsible. Um, a problem with this sort of theory of consciousness and it being the sort of consciousness that matters for criminal responsibility is that after having sat in, again, on many homicide trials, it seems that there are lots of cases where people don't have a very explicit conscious thought in this way and we want to hold them responsible. Um, a huge percentage of the crimes that make it to trial um, are cases where there isn't a very slow, deliberative plan, right? You see on TV all these cases where people are thinking about their, their, their plan to commit a crime for months in advance. That's not usually how it happens. Much more often, you know, it's a fight in a bar that goes wrong, right? And people always, defendants very often describe that moment when they killed someone as, I just snapped, I blacked out, I don't really remember it. It's like I was floating above my body. Right? They didn't have that sort of very specific thought about a thought, but we probably still want to hold these people responsible. Um, another example that I've come up with for a, for a piece that I'm <coughs> writing right now is the habitual thief. We have cases of pickpockets, for example, who it's become so routine for them to pickpocket that they're you know, rushing across a train station 
and they come on the other side and they've stolen wallets. And they honestly, they don't really remember doing that, but the action is so routine and they're so in the habit of doing it that they stole. Don't we wanna hold this person responsible? Probably, but they did not have a conscious thought about a thought, right? Um, so in these cases, we wanna hold somebody responsible even though they lacked a hot, right, a higher order thought. Um, maybe we wanna hold these people less responsible who didn't have a higher order thought. Um, but what seems to matter to responsibility is not that the culpable action was generated by a conscious thought about a thought, because there's none in these cases, right? What seems to matter is something else, and we're gonna explore that in a minute here. Another problem with the hot theory of consciousness and it being the sort of consciousness that matters to criminal responsibility is the potato case, right? No one actually has a good description of why thinking about a thought would make it conscious. No cognitive neuroscientists have come up with a description of why this would be the case, right? I can think about a potato or a microphone. I'm thinking really hard about that microphone right now. It doesn't become conscious, right? Just me thinking about it hard doesn't make the microphone itself conscious. But this theory really says that me thinking about another part of my brain really hard makes it conscious without any description of how that happens or even why necessarily. So people have wondered about the theory because there hasn't been any kind of neuroscientific evidence that have come, that's come forward to support it. Also, it's a quite a restrictive theory, right? If you have to have a higher order thought about a thought to make a thought conscious, which is what proponents of this theory say, then bats and infants are not conscious, okay? And that's what these theorists say, that those entities are not conscious in any real sense. And that seems a little far-fetched, right? I mean, we all think our dogs are conscious and are six months old, so. Okay, so just to quickly recap where I've been, what sorts of consciousness might matter to criminal responsibility? Um, it can't be phenomenal consciousness either at the creature level or the state level because that sets the bar too low. Then we have bats that are responsible. Um, but the hot theory, as a theory of consciousness, there's some questions about it how it works, and it seems too restrictive. It sets the bar too high, right? Then we're not holding people responsible that we probably would want to. So what's left? Access consciousness. Um, access consciousness argues that a conscious state is one that is poised for use in reasoning and for direct rational control of action and speech. And there's various types of access consciousness theory. The most popular one is called global workspace consciousness. Um, where consciousness is thought of as a workspace in your cognitive architecture, where representations of the world and what kind of you want out of the world gets manipulated and shared by other parts of your brain. Um, so that your whole brain has access essentially to stuff that's happening in the global workspace and then you can generate behavior from this global workspace. It's like a central command center, right, for your behavior. Um, proponents of this theory, like Neil Levy, who's a famous um, cognitive scientist and philosopher at Oxford, says that this is really what moral responsibility rests upon because when you have the kind of command center, then the action that issues from it is unified, agent-centered behavior, right? So it kind of represents then yourself, your character, and not just different disjunctive parts of your brain. Levy wasn't the person who came up with this sort of consciousness. Um, that was a neuroscientist, a cognitive scientist called Bars. This is just a picture of what global workspace consciousness is supposed to look like. So we have the global workspace here in the middle where these deliberative plans are um, being made and then enacted. And then we have all the different kind of subsystems that are feeding into the global workspace. And then I want you to pay special attention to this bit in the corner, which is executive functions. These are the actual operations that happen on the representations in the global workspace. This is the stuff that does the deliberation, the planning, the attentional work, which you should pay attention to, task switching, which means you know, deciding you should leave that alone for a while and move on to something else. Those executive functions are largely unconscious, although you can feel the effects of them in the global workspace in your 
in your consciousness. Okay, so Neil Levy, who I already mentioned, has argued that this is the sort of consciousness that we have, and this is the sort of consciousness that matters to criminal responsibility. And he uses the case of Ken Parks as an example. Has anyone heard of this case? This is a true story. Um, it's a Canadian case. Ken Parks had a history of sleep abnormalities. He had been seeing a doctor for night terrors and sleepwalking. Um, and one night, he got up from his bed with his wife, drove 23 kilometers to his in-law's house, and killed his um, mother-in-law and tried to kill his father-in-law, and then left <coughs> the home and he says, came to with blood all over his hands and then drove himself to a police station and said, I think something terrible has happened. I think I hurt somebody. Turned himself in. Okay. Um, the courts found him not guilty for, because he did not supposedly have a voluntary act. In this case, he was sleepwalking. Okay? And his, the physician he'd been seeing for his sleep abnormalities testified for him. And Levy says that this is that the court came to the right decision in this case because Parks had no consciousness in the way that matters. Um, he was acting from these rote kind of action plans that operate subconsciously, and he can't be responsible, right? He has global workplace is shut down when you're asleep. There is no deliberation and planning. You're not conscious in the normal way. And so he didn't have moral agency, Parks, and he shouldn't be held responsible. He couldn't deliberate with regard to the consequences of his acts. Okay, so this is our kind of fourth possibility for the sort of consciousness that matters for criminal responsibility based on the global workplace theory. And the thought is we're not responsible when our thoughts are subconscious and they lead to our behavior, right? Because in this case, moral agency isn't engaged. We're not making kind of central command um, decisions. Um, and instead, we're kind of acting in this weird associative way that doesn't reflect deliberative planning. <laughs> this is Neil Levy's theory. And he's about to publish a book with Oxford in March on this theory. It's very cutting edge. My colleague, Bill Herstein, and I um, agree with a lot of it, but disagree <laughs> kind of at the bottom line that it's consciousness itself that matters in the Parks case and in other cases of criminal responsibility. We uh, agree with an access theory of consciousness. Um, but in the global workspace, there's two things happening, right? There's the consciousness that's generated by a representation or thought being in the global workspace. And then there's the operations that are done on those thoughts that are done by that unconscious section that was up in the corner, executive functions. And Bill Herstein and I have argued in other pieces and are arguing now in a piece um, that's going to be published in the next six months that it isn't the consciousness itself that matters, but these operations that are done on the thoughts within the global workspace that matters to criminal responsibility. That it's the suite of executive functions, far more than consciousness itself, that matters. And that's what I'm going to argue now for the rest of our time. Um, Executive functions reside in the newest part of our brain, evolutionarily speaking, in the prefrontal lobes. And <clears throat> there's some disagreement about what the list of executive functions exactly is. But there's agreement on these, attention, planning, task switching, decision making, forming intentions, and inhibiting actions. And the way in which these lists are developed is by people who have brain abnormalities, um, a spike to the brain, some sort of stroke, we can see these functions kind of being taken out by different brain abnormalities. So we know that they, they functionally reside there. Um, those functions, we say, are really what matters to responsibility because they are what drives agency in action. And they're unconscious. So we're saying we need to focus when the court is looking to see if someone's responsible. We don't want to ask, are you conscious? We want to ask, do you have a fully engaged and normal suite of executive functions? And were they operational at the time that you committed the act? Could they have been engaged at the time that you committed the act? OK, so we argued in this article in 2011 in a journal called Consciousness and Cognition 
this. Our current best theories of consciousness portray it as a workspace in which executive processes operate, but what is important to the law is what is done with the workspace content rather than the content itself. This makes executive processes more important to the law than consciousness, since they are responsible for channeling conscious decision making into action or inhibiting action. All right, and so now I'm going to try and convince you we're right. <clears throat> Arguments to support our position. Remember these heat of passion cases. I said the typical murder case, right, is, a, is oftentimes a defendant who claims, I don't really know what happened. I don't remember it very clearly. There's extreme emotional kind of distress going on at the, at the time. Um, well, these cases are tough for Levy, too. Levy says that consciousness, in his sense, is a necessary condition for criminal responsibility. So if you don't have consciousness, in his sense, you're not responsible. Well, it's unclear to me that these people who commit the kind of typical homicide crime that gets you to court at 26th and Cal are conscious in his sense, right? He says you have to be conscious in order for that action to be issued from your agency. And I don't think that these people are conscious in his sense, right? The global workplace is kind of shut down, suboptimal in these cases. So he probably couldn't hold these people responsible either. And our argument is this. <clears throat> if you have a, a normal suite of executive functions, which we can test using ver various cognitive tests, that could have get been engaged in that moment, you're responsible. Right? So even in these cases where the person didn't slow down and count to 10 and make a decision, but they could have, they're responsible. However, if there's something wrong with your executive suite, which, and I'll talk about some of those cases, then you may not be responsible. So we argue that the problem is that Levy's theory, like the hot theories, is often too restrictive, right? Consciousness seems to be binary, all or nothing, on his theory. And it's really hard to then pin mor moral and criminal responsibility on those, on consciousness versus not conscious. Um, we also think that we have a better account for the habitual thief. The habitual thief is fully responsible because he has fully normal executive processes as well, and he could have engaged them. He could have walked across the busy train station saying, I'm not going to steal today, I'm not going to steal today, and not stolen. He didn't. He's responsible, even if he has no conscious memory of stealing the wallet on our theory. And our position is also supported by a lot of, well, not enough, but some new programs in rehabilitative programming, um, especially in the Cook County Jail. So Sheriff Tom Dart is notorious for being a proponent of rehabilitative programs in the Cook County Jail, and a lot of them focus on mindfulness. This is teaching inmates to slow down, engage their executive processes before they make decisions. Anger management, addiction management, he has them doing beekeeping, <laughs> he has them doing gardening. These are all programs that teach people to be deliberate and slow in their decision making, right? To try and learn to think, which is engage your executive processes when you act. So who isn't responsible on our account? Well, we still wouldn't hold the sleepwalker responsible. You cannot willfully engage your executive processes when you're asleep. If Parks was truly asleep, he could not have slowed himself down and made a better decision. And you see this if, if you're a person that dreams. You know, what, one of the most important things that executive processes do is when you have a perception that seems crazy, you stop and you think, whoa, that can't be my friend here in the grocery store. I know there, that she's in India right now. So you think, you correct for that perception. But in dreams, people fly away like birds, right? You can't correct for that perception in a dream. Clearly, your executive processes are disengaged. They can't be engaged. And in cases of insanity, the most common sort of um, mental illness that leads to a successful plea of insanity is schizophrenia. The schizophrenics not only have hallucinations and delusions, faulty perceptions, but they have faulty executive processes that cannot inhibit or correct for those faulty perceptions. Um, so those people should not be fully responsible. <clears throat> How am I doing for time? Okay. So what about the culpability of psychopaths? This is a, a fun topic that we've been working on recently. Um, we published a pa paper last year on psychopaths. 
there's been a lot of dispute about whether psychopaths should be held responsible. Um, what seems to be going on with psychopaths is that they have flattened affect, which means they don't feel bad when people are crying and telling them, no, please stop. They don't have normal autonomic responses. Um, and, but they do oftentimes, oftentimes, have higher than normal IQs. Um, and so people have really argued, well, are they responsible? Yes, they're fully responsible. No, some of the famous legal scholars have said no, they're not fully responsible. They can't understand moral reasons because they don't have kind of normal emotional responses. And we looked at the literature and we realized that one of the dis problems um, that's generating all of this disagreement is that the group psychopath is a heterogeneous group. That is, there's two different types of psychopaths. And they've been distinguished now in the literature by the terms, not very helpful terms, successful and unsuccessful psychopaths. Um, successful ones are the ones that get away with their crimes usually for a long time, and unsuccessful ones are the ones that are constantly in jail or in prison. But it turns out that if you um, start doing um, experiments, as Rain and Yang um, have done on these groups, that the successful ones have fully intact executive functions. And the unsuccessful ones do not. They have diminished executive function. They can't inhibit. So we would argue that some psychopaths probably are fully responsible. The really wily ones, actually, right? The ones that do the most amount of damage. They could inhibit. And we liken psychopaths to people who are colorblind. They are missing perception of an aspect of the world, right? If you're colorblind, it's not an excuse that you're colorblind that you blow through a red light. You have to correct for that faulty perception. You know you have a faulty perception, and you either don't drive, or you learn the positions of the lights, or you figure a way to drive safely. For successful psychopaths, they have a faulty perception of the world. They're not perceiving people's emotions in the right way. They're not representing them in the right way. But most of them are on notice that they have this flaw from a very early age. And there is some cognitive behavioral therapy works on these psychopaths that are successful ones. They can learn to slow down. They can learn just like autistics can, that certain facial expressions mean, no, you're supposed to stop now. Some of them do and some of them don't. The ones that don't are responsible in our view. The ones that could not do rule following to correct for their behavior, the unsuccessful ones that do not have normal executive suites, they're not as responsible. They may still be dangerous. We might have to figure out what to do with them. But they're not fully criminally culpable, we argue. OK, so some general conclusions. <clears throat> uh, our perspective is this. People with intact executive functions, regardless of whether they are engaged at the time of the decision to act, the quality of their representations of the world, and of their conscious experience that the agent has, these are the people that are responsible. Okay, If you have normal executive functions, and you could have engaged them at the time of the act, you're responsible. Even if you had no conscious experience at that time. Contra Levy. Um, people can be deemed to be less than fully responsible in our view. Juveniles are a perfect example. There's been a lot of um, interesting debate about the culpability of juveniles. It turns out that <clears throat> the prefrontal lobes are not fully developed until, anybody have a guess? What age? 27. <laughs> right? 27, yet we are throwing 14-year-olds in prison right, for the rest of their lives. Um, there's a question right now if we can keep them in prison without the possibility of parole. Right? The, we can't do that mandatorily, according to the Supreme Court, but we can do it if we jump through certain hoops. Um, that seems just wrong. A 14-year-old does not have a fully functioning executive suite. They do not. Um, so, and what we're doing, by the way, when we throw them in prison is stunting their ability to ever have a fully functioning executive suite because it will not develop under those conditions. Um, so juveniles are less responsible on our view, and we have kind of very specific arguments about why that is, and we have arguments about how they should be handled if they do commit crimes, such as to not stunt their possible cognitive development. Um, others with com compromised mental capacity, like the mentally retarded, also held fully responsible <clears throat> unless 
well, held fully responsible. They cannot be executed if they have an IQ of 70 or below now, but they can still be held fully responsible, okay, with a mental age of seven or eight. That's insane, okay? They can't pay attention. They can't do task switching. They can't contemplate and deliberate their actions in the way a normal cognitive person with normal cognitive abilities can, and we have an argument as to why they shouldn't be held fully responsible, even though they have, note, conscious experiences, right? Even in Levy's sense. <clears throat> Larger conclusions from our research. It may seem that criminal responsibility depends on consciousness because oftentimes those decisions that are worked on by the executive are conscious, but it isn't the case that it's, res that it's consciousness that matters, we say. Instead, it's those, those functions that are working on the conscious thought. There are many different types of consciousness, but the theories of consciousness that seem best poised to make a difference to responsibility assessments don't seem to make a good case that it's consciousness itself that responsibility depends upon. Instead, it's the capacity for attention, reflection, and planning that matter, and these capacities are best envisioned as executive functions. And thus, <coughs> it's these executive functions that really matter to responsibility, and our ability to test these functions is increasing with every week that passes, um, fMRI studies are notoriously difficult <laughs> and suspect sometimes, but maybe eventually we'll even be able to test one's functional capacities using something like an fMRI. All right. Okay. <clears throat>